Hi, everyone. Hello. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining uh, today. I hope you're not tired of me because I'm going to be introducing our amazing moderator, Jess Corrigan, who's a good friend of mine and a partner at Castles, who is also a sponsor of this conference. Today is a panel on Section 12, and I'm going to start off by laying out the case that's going to be in part discussed by today's panel which, if you're not familiar, it's the case of Bissonnette. On May 27, 2022, the Supreme Court rendered its judgment in Bissonnette. The case centered on the validity of Section 745.51 of the Criminal Code, which allowed for a sentencing judge to stack periods of parole ineligibility for multiple murders. Under Canadian law, an adult convicted of first-degree murder receives an automatic life sentence with no chance of parole for 25 years. When an accused commits multiple murders, the sentencing judge had the power under Section 745.51 to impose consecutive periods of parole ineligibility for each murder in 25-year increments. So it's the stacking of parole ineligibility not quite the stacking of sentencing, although some uh, see this as a distinction without a difference. For instance, Alexandra Bissonnette, the, claim, the, the accused in this case, murdered six people. So this was the mosque mass shooting in Quebec City, a, a terribly tragic and horrific event. So under Section 745.51, the sentencing judge could have imposed a life sentence with no chance of parole for up to 150 years. Mr. Bissonnette challenged, I believe he was sentenced actually to, to 40 years um, with stacked, stacked um, parole ineligibility, but the, um, the, he challenged even that. He challenged the constitutionality of the provision on the grounds that it constituted cruel and unusual punishment and thus unjustifiably violated his Section 12 rights under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And the court agreed unanimously and struck down this sentence on uh, stacking of parole and eligibility. I will now leave it to Jess to take it to the panelists and to introduce them. everyone. Uh, thank you, Christine, for that introduction. Uh, I'll start with some housekeeping. So we're going to begin, uh, I'm going to introduce the panelists, and then I'm going to allow them to each give an opening statement of up to 10 minutes. And then we're going to move into questions and then open it up to the floor. So whoever has questions can pick the brains of these intellectual giants. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited. Uh, we're going to get some really unique perspectives today. Uh, and that's very uh, important. So I'm going to start by introducing uh, Lisa Kerr. Lisa Kerr is an associate professor at Queen's University uh, Faculty of Law, which is where I went to law school, and it's very near and dear to my heart. She teaches courses on criminal law, evidence, sentencing, prison law, uh, and she serves as the director of the criminal law group at Queen's Law. Uh, Professor Kerr earned her JD at the University of British Columbia. We won't hold that against you. And uh, she clerked with the BC Court of Appeal and was an associate at Faskin Martineau. Uh, she also served as a staff lawyer at the Prisoners Legal Services, Canada's only dedicated legal aid office uh, for prisoners, uh, and earned an LLM and JSD at New York University, where she was named a Trudeau Scholar. I also won't hold that against you. <laughs> <laughs> Along with her academic publications, Professor Kerr regularly participates in judicial education and publishes opinion pieces in these areas. Uh, welcome, Professor Kerr. Next up, we have Yuan Jiu, uh, who is an assistant professor 
uh, of International Relations and International Law at Leiden University, a research fellow at Harris Manchester College, uh, Oxford, and a senior research fellow at Policy Exchange's Judicial Power Project. Uh, before uh, going to Oxford, he obtained a BA from McGill University, where he was an Alan Oliver Fellow and Moist Scholar, and uh, Masters of Philosophy from the University of Cambridge, where he was a Bacon Scholar. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Xi's research is concerned with the notion of sovereignty within the context of international law. In particular, Yuan is interested in the influence of non-Western powers such as China on the development of legal understandings of sovereignty. He also maintains secondary research interests in his understandings of political history and public law and currently serves as a research associate at UBC's Center for Constitutional Law and Legal Studies. Last but not least, we have Stephen Penny, who is a professor at the Faculty Law of the University of Alberta. Born and raised in Edmonton, he received a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Law from the University of Alberta and a Master's of Law from Harvard Law School. He researches, teaches, and consults in the areas of criminal procedure, evidence, substantive criminal law, privacy, uh, law, and technology. He's co-author of Criminal Procedure in Canada and co-editor of Evidence, a uh, Canadian casebook. Anybody who has uh, been to law school has <laughs> no doubt had these textbooks. Uh, and he's a member of the advisory boards of the Alberta Law Review and Canadian Journal of Law and Justice and chair of the Center for Constitutional Studies Advisory Board. Uh, he, previously, he was the dean uh, at the Faculty Law of the University of Alberta. Associate. Sorry, Associate Dean. Yeah. I, 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 would, Please don't ask me. I would have taken, I would have just taken it and run with it, but thank you for the clarification. <laughs> Uh, a visiting professor at the University of New Brunswick and a law clerk to Mr. Justice Gerard uh, Laferre of the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, if that wasn't enough for you, he is the winner of the Faculty of Law Tevi Miller Teaching Excellence Award in 2020 and uh, the Law Society of Alberta and Canadian Bar Association Distinguished Service Award for Legal Scholarship in 2021. Welcome, uh, Professor Penny. Uh, so now I'm going to defer to our panelists to uh, each give an opening statement. Uh, Lisa will go first, followed by Yuan, followed by Stephen. Great. Well, thank you so much for that. Uh, everyone hear me? Is that good? Uh, good morning. Uh, I thought with my 10 minutes, what I would do is identify the key moves in the court's reasoning in Bissonnette and talk a little about the significance of the case to Section 12 doctrine generally. Um, I thought that would help sort of ground us in the actual decision before we move on to more in the way of commentary. But before I do that, I want to just lay down five quick points about the decision. First, this seems to have been an easy one for the court. It's unanimous. Um, it's decided, it's handed down two months after the hearing. It's plainly obvious at the hearing what the court's going to do. And it's worth noting that unanimity is unusual in the context of Section 12 cases. You can think of contemporary cases like Nur, Lloyd, Boudreaux. We find a divided court in each. Two, the legal holding in this case is extremely narrow in terms of the constitutional limit that it announces. Bissonnette says, in effect, that the state cannot intentionally impose a sentence meant to ensure death in prison. Now, if death in prison is a byproduct rather than the aim of the sentence, that is okay, the court says. Three, the decision explicitly holds that the rest of the murder sentencing regime in the criminal code is constitutional. Now, that's not even really before the court, but they go out of their way to affirm a case from 1990 that says the life plus 25 years of ineligibility is constitutional. Now, that is a very tough mandatory sentence. That's what it took. That was part of the trade-offs to abolish the death penalty in 1976. It's a very tough sentence. It results in many people dying in prison. Um, but the court kind of lets us know, don't bother bringing any more charter challenges to the rest of this regime, OK? Um, fourth, the court leaves open the possibility uh, of a future parliament going above 25 years. That is still on the table after Bissonnette. Um, uh, you know, a future parliament could make it possible for judges to go to 30, 35. It would have to depend on the age of the offender. 
prisoners tend to die when they're 60, so you tend to need to ensure that someone's alive at the age of 59 so they can go in front of their parole board. That's really all BCNET holds. Final point, and I know we know this, but it's worth emphasizing, this decision will not necessarily lead to the release of any person. The parole board is extremely risk averse as a rule, and especially so with people on indeterminate sentences, people with uh, life sentences. And I could take you to the data on the almost non-existent amount of crime that these people commit, and that would confirm for you how risk averse the parole board is. Anyone who would commit a crime really is not released. Um, and it is fair to say that anyone who would have received stacked parole under this provision, that they are facing an extraordinarily uphill battle should they be alive in 20 years, and should they seek a parole hearing, both of which are, are far from certain. So my overall take is that BCNET is an extremely minimalist response to a poorly designed law, a law that left judges with no good options for trying to fulfill the legislative intent behind it, which was, of course, for judges to be able to respond to the greater levels of moral blameworthiness involved in killing multiple people. The law just did not enable a sensible approach to that task because it only allowed these blocks of 25 years. Okay, so let me get into the court's reasoning. Leading up to Bissonnette, we can summarize the area by saying that the Supreme Court had set a very high standard for a breach of Section 12. Smith holds in 1987, the penalty has to be grossly disproportionate to the penalty that would be proportionate. Later cases reject arguments in favor of a lower standard. It was tried, you know, something closer to the appellate standard, disproportionality, merely unfit. The court says no, keeps that high standard. But Smith simultaneously allows this forgiving procedure for claimants, allowing claimants to make use of what comes to be known as the reasonable hypothetical device. Um, now, uh, there's a big discussion. It's probably the most controversial part of Section 12 doctrine. We may talk about it more later. Suffice to say, it was a hugely significant move. Every single mandatory minimum that the Supreme Court has struck down has been done not on the basis of the offender in the case at bar. It was done on the basis of a reasonable hypothetical, one advanced by counsel and accepted by the court. But Bissonnette, it's not a mandatory minimum case. The judges had discretion as to whether to stack the parole ineligibility. And we've seen judges decline to do it. One prominent example, Bruce MacArthur, a great candidate for a 175-year sentence, if we've ever heard of one. And the judge declines to do it. He says, I refuse to engage in the symbolism of it. Now, many thought this discretion would save the provision. And that's really at the heart of the submissions of the government lawyers before the court. One thing was clear, the reasonable hypothetical device, which has been so powerful in the hands of those challenging these laws, sentencing laws, would have no place in the case because judges would never have to stack the parole ineligibility. No, there was sort of no world in which they would have to do that for an inappropriate case. So how does the court get around the fact that this wasn't mandatory? And perhaps more importantly, how could we say that this penalty was grossly disproportionate for Mr. Bissonnette? If this guy dies at the age of 60, which is of course the average age of death for prisoners, it'll be a mere 30 years or so for him in prison. Many people are sitting in Canadian penitentiaries today for that length of time or longer. And the gravity of his offense, it's almost unspeakably high, taking the lives of six men peacefully at prayer, acting out of pure hate, ignorance, is Islamophobia. How could this penalty be grossly disproportionate for him? We might argue it's too light rather than too harsh. What the court does, and this is the key move and a new move for Section 12, is distinguish between two kinds of Section 12 cases. And with this move, the question in Bissonnet is no longer whether it's too long of a penalty for him or for any other offender. With this approach, the court adopted a framework that Ben Berger and I had proposed in an article about the structure of Section 12. The court takes up this framework, agrees that there are two prongs to Section 12. We, said, we called it two tracks, but the court 
switched it to prongs, very disappointing. Um, but the first prong, which we can call the severity prong, is the one we know. We've had lots of cases under this prong. These are the mandatory minimum cases. And those cases look at the question of whether there's too much punishment, whether there's a severity problem, too large of a fine, too long of a prison term. The second prong has a different focus. The focus there is on the type of punishment, whether the kind or method or type of punishment is unacceptable on its face. Perhaps the lash, lobotomization, castration, capital punishment, under this prong, which we can call the method prong, the concern is not with the amount of an otherwise legitimate method of penalty, fines or imprisonment. The problem wouldn't arise when too many lashes are inflicted. The problem would be that the lash is cruel and unusual in any amount. So what's the test for this second prong? The court said the test is whether the penalty is incompatible with human dignity, and I'm gonna say more on that at the very end. What is really powerful or notable about the structure of the second prong and why it was essential uh, for the court to rely on it in Bissonnette is because the focus is no longer on the offender and no longer on the offense. That's the stuff of prong one the mandatory minimum cases that are looking at really standard sentencing factors, moral blameworthiness, the harm caused, mitigation. Under prong two, the focus is on the legitimate arsenal of sanctions available to the state. So if we, if we resurrected the death penalty, the question under section 12 wouldn't be whether any offender is bad enough to receive the penalty. It would be whether it is compatible with human dignity such that the state can ever legitimately make use of it. Now, it's fair to say that the second prong was not clearly articulated in the jurisprudence prior to Bissonnette, and that may lead some to the charge that the court made up new law in a way that's illegitimate, and there's two things to say about that. First, the structure of Section 12 was not clearly articulated before Bissonnette, largely for historical and political reasons. Canada abolished capital punishment legislatively, we moved away from corporal punishment long before the charter. These cases just weren't necessary. Now, the sec and the other thing to say is that the second prong is really the heartland, you know, conservative originalist understanding of cruel and unusual punishment. The idea that the provision prohibits cruel penal methods, that reading is exactly what we meant to adopt with section 12, and it has a long lineage in constitutional thought well before 1982. So I don't think you can disagree on the validity of this prong, nor on the fact that it's the role of judges to interpret and enforce it in a constitutional democracy, but you might still disagree about whether life without the possibility of parole qualifies as cruel and unusual punishment, okay? Whether it really is incompatible with human dignity, whether it really is degrading and dehumanizing, Maybe for you, this is not an obvious bedfellow with the lash or capital punishment. So let me end by unpacking what the court says about it. It says that a law is cruel and unusual when it denies human dignity. It says having dignity is connected to having a degree of agency and <coughs> autonomy and the possibility of redemption. Now, the court says the law can be putative, it can be tough, it can express condemnation, it ought to express condemnation. 25 years is fine before you can go in front of the parole board, the court says. But a sentence that is designed to ensure death in prison is what crosses the line and betrays these values of human dignity. In this part of its reasoning, the court also says, also considers the experience of this form of confinement that it is a monotonous, futile existence, that it entails psychological suffering akin to being on death row. So a sentence that is designed to ensure death in prison changes the character of the imprisonment. And it's crucial to note that this distinct character of imprisonment, it's not something that just kicks in at your 26th year. It changes the character of imprisonment throughout. Your life and your imprisonment are necessarily meaningless from day one to you know, day 9,000. And the court also mentions briefly that the, as a result of this kind of imprisonment, 
that prisoners sentenced under this law have no incentive to conform to prison rules. Now, the court doesn't expand really much on that, um, but I, I'll end with this point because I think it's a really interesting point that draws our attention not only to the experience of prisoners, but to the perspective of prison staff. And I do think we have to spare a thought for those who work in prisons. It's something we often don't do when we're talking about sentencing policy. We have to remember there's security staff there, but there's also a large uh, body of programming staff. There are teachers, nurses, psychologists, indigenous elders, institutional parole officers. How does their work environment change when we send them offenders who will be there for 30 years with zero reason to follow the rules, let alone attempt to be positive contributors? A life without parole sentence is basically saying to an offender, it does not matter what you do in prison. You could find God and you could counsel your, your fellow inmates on the right way to live for the next 20 years. Or you could murder two prison guards. No matter what happens, the legal system has no interest in it and we will never again open your file. So I think that is the one and only kind of prison sentence that the court in Bissonnette says is unconstitutional. And with that, I'll pass it along. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. I, I'm going to pass the floor now to Yuan. <clears throat> uh, good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, as um, I have noticed I'm not a, a criminal lawyer. Uh, I'm I do international law, and I think what happened was uh, the organizers pro probably confused me with my co-author, Kerry Sun, who's sitting there, uh, who's, an, who's actually on the international law panel. I mean, he's the Asian with glasses, right? Which, which I know is like, well, I mean, Asian with glasses, whatever, but, uh, but uh, so, so, so apologies for, uh, for any sort of uh, 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 unintentional display of ignorance. Uh, Many, many, many lawyers will say, well, international law, that's fake, that's made up, right? And they, you know, to some, extent, to some extent, it's true, but that's fine because a lot of Section 12 jurisprudence is also made up, and I think nowhere do we see this more clearly than this in it. Uh, but, but before getting to the technical analysis and the, uh, and the normative analysis of the case, I really want to describe what happened on, on the 29th of January 2017 when Alexandre Bissonnette had breakfast, he brought the internet, he had dinner with his parents on famille, and then he walked to the Quebec City Mosque and the Cultural Center, and he, in front of it, he paused, he took out his gun, and he murdered two men in cold blood. And then he walked into the prayer room of the center, and he took out another gun, and he started shooting again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and, again. and after 10 times, he took out another gun, and he continued to, to, to shoot. 19 people were wounded, six were murdered, and he did so because of pure hatred. He hated the Muslims and he wanted to kill as many of them as possible. Now, I have indulged in this description of what happened because I think when, when, when we discuss things like Section 12, sentencing policy, Bissonnette, as a, uh, as a Supreme Court case, there is this tendency to go to a certain level of, abstr of abstraction where we really forget what is at stake. Now, I have a very old-fashioned view that cases have to do, to some extent, with the uh, 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 the dispute between parties at hand, and I think it's very important before we engage in any further discussion of the technical nature to remember what exactly was done to those people that they out of pure hatred, and I'm going to come back to this in a moment. Uh, now, um, I could really sort of spend an hour unpacking the judgment and just pointing out all the internal flaws and, uh, and the contradictions and so on, but uh, I'm just going to stick to a couple of them because I think it's otherwise a bit uh, t uh, too much. For instance, um, one of the reasons the, uh, uh, re uh, the court struck down that provision of the criminal code which enabled um, uh, the stacking of um, life sentences was that it would, I quote, uh, bring the administration of justice into disrepute and undermine public confidence in the rationality and fairness of the criminal justice system. A punishment that can never be carried out is co contrary to the fundamental values of Canadian society. Now the argument here is basically a, nobody lives for 150 years, and if we were to sentence people to prison that long, the public would, uh, ha, uh, would lose confidence in, in the justice system. And, and um, I mean, this, this argument doesn't really, doesn't really survive scrutiny for more, than, for more than five seconds. 
Imagine if Parliament had said that instead of a, a sentence stacking provision that it had introduced what some Americans call life imprisonment with a parole, that is to say, if Parliament had amended the criminal code to uh, allow judges to sentence a, a person to die in prison, uh, that would not be an impossible sentence to carry out, right? It's not 150 years, it's and you are in prison until you die. Uh, and that would seem to, in its face, meet the uh, objection of the Supreme Court. But I don't think anybody here would argue that the Supreme Court would actually allow this sentence uh, uh, to stand. So this argument is really uh, uh, bullshit. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, uh, there's also something else quite interesting here, which is the notion of public confidence. Now, I'm always very skeptical when appellate courts say, well, if we do this, the public is going to lose faith in the justice system, because the question is, which public is this? Is, it, uh, is this the Canadian public, as we understand it, the collectivity of people who live in Canada, or is this the imaginary Canadian public, which judges like, uh, uh, love to invent to support their rhetorical point, uh, points? In 2022, uh, a poll showed that 51% of Canadians were in favor of that penalty, and 37% were opposed to it. I think it's fair to say that the Canadian public, uh, although perhaps not as punitive as the American public, um, uh, is not exactly soft on crime in any uh, a generally understood sense, are we really meant to believe that this public would lose confidence in the justice system because a mass murderer and a terrorist uh, was sent to prison for a very long time uh, to ask the question is to, uh, is to answer it? And of course, I think we don't give enough credit to, uh, to the public. They don't have law degrees, sure, but they are intelligent enough to know that people don't really live more than 100 years at most, right? Uh, I think the public can be trusted to understand that a sentence of 150 years to life is not meant to be served out because of biological uh, fundamentals. It is meant to send a message of disapproval of, uh, by the society to say that we disapprove of conduct such as mass murder. As criminal sentences have a, have a communicative uh, an exemplary function, and that is, um, uh, 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 and I think the public is really quite uh, intelligent enough to to, uh, to understand this. And I would also ask, what is more detrimental to the public's confidence in the justice system? To have a sentence of 150 years which cannot be carried out, or to have life imprisonment, which actually doesn't mean life imprisonment? Which, which of those two concepts does greater violence to the English language and to our basic sense of, fundamental, uh, 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 of logic? Again, I think you are um, all able to see where I'm going here. but. Uh, 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 and of course, really, the Supreme Court also doesn't believe its own logic, right? It says in the next paragraph or so, well, it's, it's okay to sentence an elderly murderer to 25 to life, even, even if they're going to die to prison because, because reasons, because uh, Parliament has an interest in, you know, uh, 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 showing its disapproval. And what the question is, um, do elderly people have less, uh, less of a claim to human dignity? Do elderly people have less of a claim to be protected against cruel and unilateral punishment? Uh, I mean, given the Supreme Court's jurisprudence and other errors, notably uh, as, as it relates to assisted suicide, I think it's probably not unreasonable to think that the Supreme Court does have a sort of ableist view of, uh, 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 of human dignity of elderly people, but, you know, I, I, I'm just going to gloss over this. But look, this is all, you know, this doesn't really, this doesn't really matter. I could go on, on and on. I could also go on about how the uh, analysis of the Supreme Court uh, as regards to international jurisprudence is badly flawed. They badly misinterpreted the, uh, the UK's ruling uh, in response to Hearst with, uh, versus the United Kingdom, for instance, they do not mention the New Zealand example, right? New Zealand is a uh, progressive paradise where they amended the criminal code to, to specifically <laughs> allow for uh, uh, life in prison without parole uh, in response to the Christchurch mosque shooting. The court just, uh, just doesn't talk about it. But you know, all this stuff is, you know, doesn't matter. Some local court judgment is probably you know, like, uh, doing a PhD somewhere where you know, uh, 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 um, uh, it, it, it's, it's fine. The Supreme Court has written bad judgments before. It's going to write bad judgments uh, you know, uh, in the future. Uh, I don't get too mad about this anymore um, after, uh, after all these years of shouting about judicial overreach. Uh, I really want to get to the more normative aspect of the judgment, which is this uh, a notion of uh, human dignity and uh, autonomy as uh, understood by the Supreme Court. Uh, the court really likes this word, right, human dignity. It uses, uses it 72 times. And of course, Section 12, as the court properly points out, was enacted to protect uh, criminal offenders from, uh, 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 from, uh, uh, um, from having their human dignity violated. So that's, you know, that's fine. Uh, but uh, something which really struck my attention was the sentence, and I'm going to read it to you. It is degrading in nature, the sentence uh, of uh, stacked sentences. It is, is degrading in nature in that it presupposes 
at the time of its imposition that the offender is beyond, uh, is beyond redemption and lacks the moral autonomy needed for rehabilitation. Now, this really embodies a view of crime, which is sort of disease-based, right? It's, uh, it's like, oh, someone has done a crime, he's sick, there's no moral capability, he can be, he can be cured. Of, uh, 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 of this crime if we give him enough programs and, uh, and send him to enough courses. Um, and I think this is actually perversely, uh, actually undermines the, um, uh, at, at, at the human dignity of Mr. Bissonnet. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to pretend and, uh, that I care very much about his human dignity. As far as I'm concerned, he should die. But, uh, but uh, moral autonomy is a two-way street, right? Uh, Mr. Nett, when he went into the mosque, he was not under the influence of, you know, um, uh, of some drug. He was not out of his mind. He knew exactly what he wanted to, to do. He had a full moral autonomy each time, each, each and every time he pulled the trigger out of pure and sheer hatred. And I think we are actually being actually quite patronizing here when we say, well, actually, you know, uh, we, uh, we can cure you. We don't really have a lot of the possibility that he really um, Seem very sincerely believe in the horrible ideology, uh, ideology which he espouses, uh, and that he cannot be cured. Right? We have this idea that oh, we can save you. Maybe we can't, and maybe, uh, and maybe think that we can actually undermines his moral autonomy. Uh, I just want to put this point out to you. And finally, I will. Uh, I'll just go to the point of the victims because the court uh, spent several paragraphs saying, "Look, this charge doesn't undermine, uh, is, and is not meant to undermine the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the dignity or the uh, worth of the lives of the, one, uh, of the people who are taken." But if this punishment for one murder and the punishment for six murder at law is the same, you do not need to be a criminal lawyer to understand that this means that each murder, uh, for each additional murder you get, you effectively get a discount. And I know people say, well, you know, he may never get out of prison, but I think if your best defense of this judgment is to say, well, uh, it's probably not going to change anything, that's not a very good judgment, is it? Uh, uh, Bissonnet appealed all the way to, to the Supreme Court, his lawyers did so, presumably because this, they thought that doing so would improve his position. And there are, what, there are I think, 70 to 100 people who, are, who have stack sentences, all of them are going to have their st uh, uh, sentence reviewed, I think he's, it defies belief that, uh, to, to, to say that none of them is ever going to get out of prison. And I think this actually, uh, uh, and, uh, and this sort of cap on punishment actually does limit, uh, uh, does send a message that actually, uh, 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 to society that additional victims are actually worth less because um, it is important to um, protect human dignity, of course, and that is why Section 12 was enacted, but the vindication of human dignity requires not only that we protect um, uh, criminals from uh, cruel and unusual punishment. It requires that we um, vindicate the value of human life by imposing appropriate and proportionate punishment on those who infringe it. And the sentence of 25 years to life for one, two, six, a hundred murders simply will not cut it. Thank you. Thank you, Yuan. Uh, that, that was very interesting. Uh, you're certainly getting different perspectives here, so now I'm excited to hear from Stephen. Uh, thank you very much. And is this on? Can you can everybody hear me? I don't think it's on, actually. It's on. Is it on? OK, sorry. I got Just hold it closer. OK, I will do that without causing feedback. <laughs> Positive feedback is welcome. Negative feedback, <laughs> not so much. Don't want to hear it. Um, okay, thanks very much, and thanks very much for inviting me uh, to this conference. It's my first time here, and uh, it's been great so far. Uh, I'm going to begin with a proposition that I don't think should be very controversial, but you can never be certain these days. The application of liberal moral theory to Western criminal justice systems, including the one we have in Canada, I think has produced... I'm just going to speak loud. Um, okay, that, yeah, this one's a lot better. Has produced the most humane and ethical formal norm enforcement regime ever devised by a large and complex society. I'm not saying Canada is number one on that list, I'm just saying we're, we're in the ballpark with other similar systems. And I think it does this in three chief ways. First, it better respects liberty in the simple million sense of freeing people to pursue their version of the good life in ways that do not cause any direct harm to others. Secondly, I think it more assiduously and accurately identifies the people who have caused direct harm to others. And then lastly, I think it affords such persons as much dignity on the whole as is compatible with a safe and well-functioning society. I think these are all good things. But 
the liberal theory of criminal justice has never been especially popular. And the reason for this, I think, and maybe there are others, but this is one of the primary ones, is that human beings are hardwired for in-group norm enforcement and retributive punishment. And these deeply held instincts, perhaps more than any other feature of our kind of evolutionarily shaped psychology, the reason why we're able to cooperate so successfully and productively with non-kin. And as a consequence, I think in contemporary justice systems, uh, the liberal approach to criminal justice and crime is at best tolerated by many members of the public. But this tolerance, I think, hinges on two conditions. The first is the maintenance of a sufficient degree of social order and public safety, such that most people perceive that they and their loved ones face minimal risk of serious victimization. And the second condition, which I think is most relevant to section 12 of the Charter and the Bissonnette decision, is the sense that the legal system takes victims and victimization seriously. And that includes a recognition that retribution or denunciation, whatever you want to call it, however visceral and, and non-instrumental, maybe in a strict sense, is still a legitimate response to serious wrongdoing. And I think this retributive instinct is most often expressed not by the courts in their kind of measured and nuanced articulation of sentencing principles, but rather by legislatures in kind of bluntly mandating that certain offenses and or offenders be harshly punished. Now, I don't doubt that in a democracy like ours that's tempered by the liberal tradition, and especially one that has expressly committed itself to judicially enforced constitutional limitations, that the courts are justified in subjecting such legislation to meaningful substantive review. Nor do I think the law that was struck down was a good one. In my opinion, it was unduly harsh, and it was certainly foolishly constructed. Maybe deliberately constructed, but I think foolishly. That said, it's my view that the Supreme Court in Bissonnette accorded too little weight to Parliament's legitimate retributive concerns and struck down a sentencing regime that, despite its flaws, was simply not cruel and unusual enough to justify overriding the democratic will. So now why do I believe that this unanimous decision was, was wrong? Well, roughly it comes down to, I think, what Professor Kerr has outlined that it does not, under any circumstances, impose a mandatory period of parole ineligibility beyond 25 years, which is the maximum duration possible before this law came into force. In other words, judges have a discretion, or had a discretion, to impose or not impose a greater period in multiple murder cases. So as a result, if this legislation had been upheld, it would have been an error of law for any sentencing judge to impose a greater period of ineligibility if that would have been an unfit or disproportionate sentence. So for example, if a judge thought in the abstract that a 40-year period of ineligibility would be the best or the fittest sentence, he or she would have had to impose a 25-year period because the only other option would be 50, which would be disproportionate and therefore unfit. So as, as Lisa's outlined, the Supreme Court had to find a way around this, right? And the way it did that was to say a 50-year sentence will always be disproportionate and that's really what we either have to buy or we have to sell. We have to accept or reject that. And I'm not sure, right? Is it the case that this will always be cruel and unusual to impose a life sentence uh, on someone who's committed multiple murderers? And I don't really know. Sentencing, I'll be honest here, is not my area of expertise. And I've always found it to be a, a bit of a black box. Like, how do we make these judgments? about what people deserve and what's appropriate and what's going to meet all of the various goals of sentencing. So to me, the better question, at least initially, is who gets to decide? And here I ask, what theory of judicial review would justify giving this decision to nine unelected officials? In what sense should people who've committed multiple murders be considered a kind of discrete and insular minority in need of protection from inhumane treatment by a majoritarian legislature. Now, it's no doubt true that people who've engaged in serious criminality are often reviled. Uh, but the question is, is that revulsion unjustified? To what extent is it unjustified? Now, keep in mind, we're not talking about a mandatory minimum sentence that has to be imposed for all persons who've committed a certain type of offense. In those types of cases, 
a court may be able to say, in effect, that while Parliament may have been justified in declaring that nearly anyone who committed this offense deserves this minimum sentence, most people, I think, would agree, if they were informed of the relevant circumstances, that there may be some small minority of individuals who, if that sentence were imposed on them, it would be inhumane. It would be cruel. It would clearly be grossly disproportionate and inappropriate. So that's why I don't take much issue with the Supreme Court's gross proportionality jurisprudence as applied to mandatory minimum sentences, even on the controversial basis of reasonable hypotheticals, which I know some people find or take issue with. Now, when it comes to the mandatory minimum situation, I think you can cast this or frame it as a kind of democratic failure, a kind of information asymmetry problem that could, in some cases, justify corrective intervention by an admittedly kind of elite, unelected body that's applying kind of consensus liberal principles. But I don't think any such malfunction occurred in this case. Parliament simply gave judges the choice, right, the ability to impose a 50-year period when they themselves believed that it would be a fit and proportionate sentence, and only in such circumstances. And in my view, even if I might disagree with those kinds of very harsh sentences, in, in part because of some of the reasons that Professor Kerr has outlined, I think Parliament should have been entitled to give them that option. So I'll end there and look forward to uh, the further questions from the, the moderator. Thank you, uh, Stephen. Uh, so the first question, and uh, this one really is, is important to me as a, as a uh, practitioner of law. I often read decisions from the Supreme Court of Canada, and I say, OK, but what's the answer? And, and what's the test, and how do I actually apply this in my actual practice? Or I read things and say, this is so disconnected from the actual practice of law that I don't know what to do with it. Um, and, and I've heard that's often the case with uh, criminal practitioners who are actually on the ground doing the job. So the first question is, do you think that the Supreme Court of Canada is the best forum in which to resolve fundamental questions about human dignity or what constitutes cruel and unusual punishment? And to what extent does the Bissonnette ruling reveal divergence in the legal profession about con the constitutional role of the Supreme Court of Canada? And, and Stephen, you just answered this a little bit, um, but by all means. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not putting you on the spot. I'm saying whoever wants to answer this, please right, well, I'll, I'll go for it. Look forward to hearing uh, what my colleagues have to have to say. So, let's maybe drill down a bit on this notion of human dignity. I don't think there's any doubt that that's something that has to be considered here. And you know, what's your theory of human dignity? Well, the theory of human dignity that seems to be applied by the court is kind of an instantiation of a, a version of I think Christian ethical theory. I think uh, the Chief Justice even talks about repenting. It's a paragraph eight where he says this objective is intimately linked to human dignity in that it conveys a conviction that every individual is capable of repenting, there's that word, and re-entering society, end quote. Now, I think that ethical theory has much to commend it, and I very much agree that the intrinsic kind of harshness of the criminal sanction needs to be tempered by values and emotions like compassion and a desire for rehabilitation when possible, possible at least as a kind of aspirational goal. But you know, retribution and denunciation are also important goals. They give voice to victims and their families and their uh, communities, uh, and also to gr the greater society's belief that certain acts may betray the social contract to such an extent as to warrant kind of a permanent exclusion from society. And in fact, um, you know, to my knowledge, I'm not an anthropologist or, you know, prehistorian, but I think that's pretty much been a feature of every society that's ever existed so far as we can tell. At least in some circumstances, people will do something that justifies within the norms of that community their permanent exclusion, whether that's by killing them uh, or by permanently banning them, shunning them, excommunicating them. So that's, that's very harsh, and maybe we've grown beyond that, but on such a fundamental question of values, especially in a case where I think the value systems that are in conflict 
break down pretty starkly along class and educational lines. Right? If you look at the polling data, and I think you co correlate that with socioeconomic status or level of education, you're going to see some pretty stark divergences there. And it's precisely in those types of cases I think courts ought to be very cautious and very reluctant to substitute their moral judgments and preferences for parliaments. Great, well, I'll take a stab at this as well. Should I do that one? Okay. Um, so first, I guess I would say, I, I do think of a life imprisonment sentence as one involving permanent exclusion. Um, the reason there is parole eligibility is really for the functioning of the prison system. I wish the court in Bissonnette had spoken more about that. Um, and the material was in front of the court from submissions by the Prison Lawyer Association, by the Queen's Prison Law Clinic, talking about how having no parole date, how it impacts conditions, programming, isolation, how it impacts staffing, how, you, how are you supposed to house these people, what kind of dangers and risks do they present. It's a very distinct kind of prisoner, and, and that was put to the court, and I frankly wish it would have been uh, that instead of using these fancy words of dignity, agency, and autonomy, because I think people read that and go, I don't give a shit about his dignity, agency, or autonomy. But I think if you can turn your mind to the prison context and understand how dysfunctional these sentences are for the prison system, I think that's more convincing for a lot of people. And why do I say it's permanent exclusion? Because the, the, va the vast majority of people, if not all, who m murder multiple people, it, they're gonna be in custody for their entire lives. Um, absent really a miracle. I don't wanna suggest the parole board doesn't approach each and every case with a fresh and open mind. But I can tell you that cases we're talking about today, uh, practically speaking, as someone f very familiar with how the parole board operates and how it makes its decisions, the absence of procedural rights, the fact that it, what they can do at the parole hearing, it's permanent exclusion for these folks. But I was disappointed that I think the prison remains a bit of a black box, even in Bissonnette, a decision all about the legitimacy of a particular sanction of, imp of imprisonment, and that's a feature, I think, of our legal system. On this question of who should decide I mean, I very much agree with everything Stephen said around the legitimacy of feelings of vengeance um, and the d demand for justice from the public um, and how harmful these offenses are and that our legal system has to give expression to that. I absolutely agree with that. Um, I think that's why this sentence was explicitly sanctioned, the first degree murder sentence of life imprisonment, uh, why that was sanctioned by the court, because of the need to give voice to that need for condemnation and denunciation. But if you're saying that let's leave to parliament the questions around what is cruel and unusual punishment, well that is saying let's not have any limits on cruel and unusual punishment. But let's be clear, that's what that means, because this is, the rights of mass murderers is not a hill that any politician is gonna die on, okay? And you can look to Bissonnette itself, right? The liberal government instructed its lawyers to forcefully defend this law, and they did. When it was handed down, David Lametti immediately tweeted his disappointment with the decision. Now, he didn't go as far as the conservative leader hopefuls of that moment, uh, Patrick Brown and Pierre Polyev, who immediately said they would invoke the notwithstanding clause, right? And think about that for a second. It's never been done by a federal government. They're going to do it in order to avoid a two-hour administrative hearing 25 years down the road, where at the end of the hearing, this gentleman is going to be taken back to his cell but they're gonna invoke the notwithstanding clause over that. So I think it tells you this is not exactly a very healthy political environment. And if we are going to have section 12 as a constitutional protection, it requires the courts to decide. There's not a politician in this country that stood up and said Bissonnette is a great decision. Now, if you wanna talk about some other section 12 cases, 
um, where the court maybe goes too far and maybe we can talk about progressive capture of the court. You know, there are decisions like Boudreaux where we might have that conversation. Bissonnette is just the wrong target. This is a very narrow limit. And it, it really is just a rule that if the point is to say to someone, what you do in prison doesn't matter, we'll never open your file again, that's the limit the court articulated. But permanent life in custody for the rest of your life, the court has no problem with that. It's just that your file and your actions and who you are and what you do remains relevant during your incarceration. All right, thank you. Uh, and again, I would just like to perhaps answer this last point first very quickly and say, well, look, if the decision didn't matter, why was so much effort uh, invested in, you know, uh, in overturning that bit of the criminal code, right? Uh, did we just all waste our time for what is essentially, apparently, a, a sort of an intellectual exercise of no uh, meaning whatsoever? That's a very interesting way of defending this decision, I think. Now, to, uh, to, um, to go back to your question, right, I think there's the consensus among the Canadian labor profession that basically the courts are, you know, staffed by philosopher kings and they have to make all the big decisions of public policy and, uh, uh, and uh, in, in, you know, uh, uh, fundamental questions about human dignity and so on, right? We have a parliament in Canada, right? It, 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 and, and, you know, it looks, it has the appearance of parliament. You know, we have MPs that are elected, we have green carpet, and there's a speaker in gown and ask questions, and at the end of the day, they have the enormous power to decide, maybe, maybe, to decide to increase the minimum period of parole eligibility from 25 years to 30 years, maybe. That's the extent of their power, apparently, right? We don't have uh, a parliamentary democracy in any meaningful sense of the world. Uh, of the world. My, uh, my foreign friends are always horrified when I show them uh, videos of what happens in the House of Commons, because it's, you know, it, 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 at this point, it could just, just be sort of tourist attraction. Um, <clears throat> Um, now, um, I don't think anybody is saying that Section 12 should be um, uh, 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 should, al uh, uh, should allow for you know torture or mutilation and so on, right? I don't think anybody is saying that courts should never enforce Section 12. That is not the structure of our constitution, uh, as much as I may wish it to be otherwise. Uh, but. <clears throat> Look, if we wanted a court of philosopher kings who do, who, who do political, who do political uh, philosophy, who, who talk about dignity and who do, who do liberal theory, we would not be appointing lawyers, would we? We would be appointing political theorists, right? Philosophers. I have lots of political theorists friends who are un unemployed. Each and every one of them knows more political theory than any of the Supreme Court justices, right? Because when you're a lawyer, when you're a judge, you don't learn any political theory at, at most. You know, you might have done one or two papers in the grad, which I think explains why, if you show the bit, sort of moral reasoning which passes for um, analysis from the Supreme Court uh, to people who actually do power to theories, so all uh, 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 so very funny, right? Um, it, uh, 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 and actually, just something which I think hasn't been reported very much. When Bissonnette was being sentenced in the Quebec Superior Court, uh, the sentencing judge uh, gave a five hour sentencing speech where he went over the whole of Western political philosophy from Aristotle to Montesquieu to Locke to, uh, 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 to Mayo and so on, right? Um, and it, just imagine you know, being a victim, being the family of a victim, being somebody who is in a wheelchair and sitting in that court, uh, uh, because he shot you, he's going to shock you, and sitting in that courtroom and listening to his sophomoric uh, lecture about political theory based on what the judge half learned 25 years ago, 30 years ago, when he was in, in CJEP. Uh, because in C <laughs> uh, because in Quebec, you, you actually do have a, have a mandatory philosophy class, right? I, I, I could actually recognize where the judge got his uh, talking points from. Uh, from. It, uh, it was actually very jarring. So, again, I think the question is really, what sort of society do we want? Do we want a society where we are ruled by philosopher kings, in which case we should really rethink judicial appointments, because we're clearly not getting the best? Uh, <laughs> what do we say? These questions of political, uh, of deep moral and political import, should be decided democratically with some judicial limits, but fundamentally by our electoral representatives. And I just finish by saying this. Uh, in, so, uh, in so way, which was the president's voting case, Justice Gonzi actually, in his dissent, proposed a reasonable compromise. He proposed a future which never, we never adopted, where he said that when there, is, there are issues which are not amenable to scientific proof because they involve fundamental questions of philosophical, political, and social considerations which are open to reasonable disagreement, courts should not 
leave the space entirely, but courts should be very mindful of the fact that there may be and, there, and that there are going to be different competing considerations, all of which we may be contradictory or incompatible, but which are unreasonable. This was in 1996, I think. And I think it's a great shame that our court decided to go for the maximalist version of uh, uh, men, uh, upper class men and women who are in the same profession deciding these questions based on the reading of liberal theory as opposed to this uh, much more reasonable compromise which Justice Kunzi um, proffered, uh, but which was rejected, sadly. Thank you. Um, so I'm looking at the time here. Uh, the next question has, has been answered quite uh, ably by uh, Professor Kerr, which is what are the actual consequences of, of the ruling, pra practically speaking? Um, and then I do have another question prepared, but I also know that you, you have uh, some of the uh, biggest intellectual heavyweights in, in the country at your disposal right now, and to the extent that you want to ask them questions about stuff you're actually interested in, I want that to happen. Um, so I guess I will ask for a show of hands. Uh, would, should I, for anyone in favor of me proceeding with the uh, questions that I have written down, put up your hand. Okay, I think we're gonna open the floor to questions. It's, it's okay, I'm not, I, it's fine, it's fine. Uh, I think you guys probably have some great questions, so please. I'll just try to hold this far, I guess. Okay, let's see, I think. I was just asking about the use of the term dignity um, and the reasoning, as I understand it, that was presented with regard to not imprisoning someone for a series of 25-year sentences without parole is that this is, in some respect, a violation of their inherent dignity. So the question that occurs to me, number one, is where does this talk of dignity come from? Was it present when this section of the Charter was being discussed? Is it inherent in the uh, rhetoric around the traditional phrase, uh, cruel and unusual punishment, uh, and therefore incorporated implicitly in those initial discussions? Or is it an importation from somewhere else? I know that it's in the uh, Basic Law of Germany, for example, created in 1948, and it's mentioned by the UN. Uh, but it seems to me that it is inherently different from the concept of cruel and unusual punishment. Cruel, we all understand. Unusual presumably means outside the norm. So to have a punishment that is dramatically different than what is the norm. And I just don't see where dignity comes in. It seems to be an artificial importation to the debate. So I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on that. Sure, I can start us. Um, moments like these, I wish my office neighbor, Jacob Weinrib, was here because he's the master of dignity. He could, tell, he could spend 10 hours here with you answering that question. But I think um, there is a very long lineage to the idea of dignity being associated with the cruel and unusual punishment prohibition. You see that in Eighth Amendment jurisprudence in the United States. Um, it's done a lot of work in that country. Um, and we really bring that in with the Smith decision. The Smith decision in 1987 is a very comparative judgment. It's all the whole U.S. history. Of, we don't really do that anymore because they're so exceptional now with their mass incarceration and the retention of the death penalty and so on. But in 1987, we, we did bring that language of dignity over from Eighth Amendment jurisprudence. But it has a long history in English law. It's one of those ones that traces back to the Magna Carta. But why I think dignity tracks quite well with cruel and unusual punishment as a, as a, as a prohibition is I think the idea of dignity reminds us of something that all humans retain by the fact of being human. And I think sometimes when we think about an offense like that committed by Mr. Bissonnette, it's very hard for us to hang on to that idea, that he retains something notwithstanding what he did and the terror that he delivered and the losses that he imposed. And so I think that's why dignity has hung in there as sort of um, uh, always present when we're talking about this prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment, because it's there to remind us that notwithstanding what the offender did, there's something they retain 
that limits what the state can do in response, and the word we tend to use for that is dignity. Okay, yeah, I don't have much to add to that. Um, you know, I don't deny that human dignity is, is foundational in some sense, and it might be useful in a more instrumental way in certain areas of constitutional interpretation. Um, I don't see it as shedding much light in the context of this particular case and this aspect of Section 12 law, just because it's capable of such varied meaning. And, and you know, in terms of someone who commits an act like this, you could say, okay, well, there was a presumption of dignity and there is a, some sort of hard limit in terms of what the state can be justified in doing to, to punish you, but that many, many people would not consider it to be an affront to human dignity to impose a punishment that de facto results in spending the rest of your life in prison. We do that already. We know for a fact that many people who are subjected to the minimum punishment of 25 years of parole ineligibility at the time they committed the offense uh, are going to die in prison. And it doesn't happen all that often because most people who commit violent crimes are younger men, but we know of examples. Um, and and, and that's gonna, we're going to have to live with that. We know that that's part that's baked into the system that existed prior to this law. So I, I just don't see dignity as really solving this problem. It's a background consideration but not one that I think that drives a clear answer to this particular question, which is why you know, I default back to Parliament to make that judgment call in the context of this particular case. I agree. I agree. I think dignity is actually sort of vague. I, I mean, some of these words, you know, which, you know, I mean, no, nobody's against dignity, right? You know, like nobody's going to go out there and say, well, actually, no, I, I want to treat people, you know, in a way which undermines the dignity. But, uh, uh, but then you can obviously use this very vague, vague uh, word, which has, uh, you know, a, a, a whole tradition of Western political thought behind it uh, and basically smuggle in uh, whatever you want by sort of cherry picking bits and pieces which fit, uh, I think, your uh, view. So I don't think, yeah, I, I agree with something. It, it doesn't really do anything analytically. It do doesn't do any lifting at all. So based on that, if, if the real reasons, are the practical implications, as you suggest, for not doing this, how would, the, how would you suggest the court get there yeah. to strike it down? That's such a brilliant question. I've thought about it quite a bit because I get to that part of Bissonnette and I go, why is this so thin? Um, you know, there's so much more to say from a policy perspective about why this is such a dysfunctional sentence. But it is because the court really has to focus on the individual asserting the charter right, right? And why it's a violation of dignity for him. And it's not an appropriate place, actually, in constitutional interpretation for a court to go very far into what's a sensible way to run a prison system. Right, because that really is a policy question and that's the domain of, of parliament and so on. So uh, when they say he lacks incentive to conform to prison rules, that's kind of as close as they get. Um, and I, I was a bit cheeky at the end. I, I, I was gonna alert you to the fact that this is more of a policy argument against the law, but I hooked in by saying, <laughs> you know, the court said he has no incentive and that's part of the deprivation of his dignity because lacking any reason while you're in a prison for decades, lacking any reason for waking up, for having a shower, for doing a program, for taking a meal, um, you know, let alone following the prison rules and not getting involved in the drug trade and not stabbing your cellmate and all the other things. Um, that's the denial of deprivation, that's the denial of his dignity, and we're really focused on him because he's the rights holder, and all courts are supposed to do is adjudicate the claims of the rights holder. But I, I got a little cheeky in sneaking some of that other stuff in about why this is a bad law. Yeah. court. I mean, it just seems that they've changed their minds with respect to so many things, looking at 
um, Section 12. It used to be in the case of Hamilton dealing with a young black woman who was a, a mule in a trafficking case. They said, no, no, you can't give a lower sentence. Now they've come over Sharma. You say, yes, we can give a lower, lower sentence. So uh, over time, I just just do with whatever the law is type thing. I got sort of tired of tracking it. But, but let me just push back on your concept of your utilitarian argument and policy for a moment and go back to dignity, I'm afraid. And, and what bothers me about your argument, uh, Professor Kerr, uh, Kerr or Kerry, sorry, Thank Kerr, um, is you don't recognize the fact that, you know, the only the example I want to go to is Groundhog Day, Bill Murray and Groundhog Day. He certainly pursues a nihilist way of life in the beginning of that movie. But somewhere he changes. He recognizes in and of, in, in and of himself, with his own moral agency, he, he realizes that to become, you know, he starts pursuing actions which make him a better person. Now, in the end, he's rewarded because it's the end of the movie and he gets out of that little town. But I, I think you're sort of lacking, a, 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 you know, what you're, what you're saying respectfully is lacking the recognition that sometimes people want to change this simply for themselves. Sure, the law is not going to recognize and benefit them. And I have that in sensing sometimes. I say to the court, look, my client has undergone all these counseling things and he's become a better person. He's going to church now, whatever, right? And the judge says, I'm really happy for you. Good for you. But I'm still sending you, you know, still giving you the mandatory <laughs> minimum on the gun sense of three years. But you know what? My client accepts it. Because he knows that when those three years are over and he gets out, he won't be coming back, right? So it, it's, you know, there's a recognition of a moral sense, which I think is lacking in your argument, again, respectfully. I think that's a nice point. And uh, I think uh, if what you're saying is, listen, many people change without a sort of incentive structure. Um, and in fact, that may even be a more profound kind of human experience. Maybe you do it because of your relationship with God, not because of what you plan to tell the parole board. Um, and, 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 and I have no doubt that that, that remains possible, um, no matter your sentence. Um, and that is the ultimate dignity that we do retain, regardless of state action, that we can always choose for ourselves. Even in prison, there's, there's that freedom there. And it's important, I think, to talk to prisoners about that when they're especially hopeless and so on. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that for you and I, the prospects of that might be much higher than for the people who are in our penitentiary. 75% of them haven't even finished high school. Um, you know, literacy issues. I mean, they're not the movies where you're sitting around reading, you know, about the Dalai Lama in your cell. I mean, these are people who have a really, really hard time. Um, with introspection, with reflection, with doing counseling, with taking the steps um, that make true personal transformation possible. Um, we're all probably a lot better at it than anyone in a prison. And so sometimes they really do need a very blunt choice architecture um, to ensure them, to encourage them to go to programs and to not beat people up and not attack one another. And so, you know, I, I, I think it's a nice point, I hear you, um, uh, but there's also the realities of, of um, the privilege um, that it takes to be in a position to, to enter into that kind of process of self-transformation. Just very briefly, I, I don't doubt for a second that these incentives are particularly effective in a lot of cases, but I think it's a bit of an exaggeration. I would push back slightly on Professor Kerr's point. I mean, there are still some carrots and some sticks available to someone who has no possibility of release um, in terms of the conditions of their, uh, of their sentence. So I would just access add that. Books, right, right, exactly. Uh, just to say very quickly, uh, I, I agree with your point. And uh, I mean, uh, I also to push back a bit, uh, I, don't think, uh, I mean, I accept the point that people who are incarcerated tend to you know, have lower levels of literacy, education, and social economic status, and so on. I don't think that makes them worse people. I think, uh, or I, or I don't think that somebody's possibility at repentance in real and, uh, and meaningful and deep way is uh, dependent on, uh, on their uh, having, uh, them having a high school diploma, right? I think it's, uh, uh, it's something much more fundamental than that. Uh, and, uh, and also the other point I would make is that I don't think we should be necessarily making sentencing policy 
um, based on um, the limited capacity of correctional services can to run prisons. I think if we were to adjust um, 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 to you know our, our, our laws to uh, what the federal bureaucrats can, can achieve, that is really sort of a uh, uh, that, that creates very perverse incentives to fair race uh, uh, to the bottom right, where we where, where you know it's a sort of feedback loop where well you know like the bureaucrats come come and say well you know yeah, it's, it's so difficult for us in the department just you know goes lower and lower and lower uh, in terms of sentencing, sentencing policy or anything else. go back to dignity. Oh, okay. So does does it work? Yeah. So I was just going to highlight, I, I think uh, we're supposed to be done at noon. It is noon. But I, oh. sorry, 1215. I will not cut things off. I was going to let things keep going, uh, but look to Christine for the answer. So please go ahead. Okay. So, so the question then, I mean, does that violate anyone's dignity to keep them here past 1215, <laughs> right? Um, but that is actually the question I wanted to ask. It seems to me that there are two competing understandings of dignity that are at play here, at least two. So the one is this sort of freestanding entitlement that the convicted murderer in this case would have had to a certain minimum level of treatment. And this is, I, I've noticed that at least uh, Professor Kerr and Professor Penny, you've kind of suggested a tension between this conception of dignity and the feelings of retribution that are maybe more or less legitimate. But then there's another version of dignity that I think you on touched on, which is the idea that dignity requires you to kind of bear the responsibility, morally speaking, for your actions. Um, and I don't need to like, leave liberal theory to get to a version of dignity like this, that Kant endorses this, uh, Hegel endorses this. This is their theory of, cr of criminal sentencing in a nutshell, right? Your dignity, yes, you have your right to dignity, but the dignity of the victim of the crime requires retribution. So uh, I'm wondering if you uh, get some thoughts on that from uh, various members of the panel. Yeah, I'd just sort of reiterate that while it doesn't mean that we have to stop where we are and that things can't be made better, largely from the will of, of Parliament, but with some judicial oversight, uh, I think we underappreciate and undervalue the extent to which our criminal justice system, unlike almost any other that's existed, uh, have values dignity and autonomy in the liberal sense. We, you know, most human societies you know, may pay some attention in some circumstances to questions of agency and free will and mens rea and responsibility, but for the most part, it's based on consequence and, you know, kin affiliation and compensation and retribution. So, you know, this is a pretty advanced and not intuitively, you know, human way of dealing with wrongdoing, um, but I think it's it's a very humane one that I personally endorse, but I think we do have to sometimes stop and recognize that it's counterintuitive. It's not really baked into our human nature um, in the way that maybe some people assume having grown up in this culture, in this environment, and that there are some perhaps hard limits on how far we can go down the path of you know, being compassionate and affording people maximal autonomy and dignity when they've done very, very serious uh, harm to society. Um, I appreciated that question. I, I like this idea of dignity. A, a component of dignity might be the ability to de bear deserved punishment and to recognize that it is deserved. Um, and I, I think that's probably a really important, for, you know, there are a handful of lifers who become really profound. <laughs> and once they're released, they do a lot of profound work. And I think um, there's not one of them who wind up doing quite well eventually who wouldn't agree with that being an important aspect of their own dignity, that they recognized what they did, that they took on the punishment, that they stopped battling against the punishment, um, and that that's hugely important for their healing. Um, and I think, you know, I, 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 on this particular case, I think life imprisonment with 25 years parole ineligibility does the trick in terms of ensuring that they receive a punishment that they do deserve. Um, and I'll just say, you know, I, I, I think it is important that we respect that people make choices when they commit offenses. Um, I think that is important. 
And that's why in the Gladue, someone else mentioned Hamil Hamilton, in the Gladue and Morris contexts, where we see courts consider how background and systemic factors of indigenous and black people might affect the sentence they receive, I think it's a very important part of that jurisprudence that it remains an individualized sentence, that it is not a race-based sentence discount. The Supreme Court has guarded against it becoming that, quite properly in my view. Um, sentencing should be individualized. Now, it happens to be the case that for many racialized and indigenous people, their life experience that is relevant to the sentence that should be imposed on them, right, has to be brought to bear in order to impose a fit sentence. That is not a race-based sentence discount. That's an individualized sentence that takes in the actual evidence um, that went into their offense. Um, so I just agree with that speaker that um, respect for autonomy is an important part of sentencing. If there's still any time, I want to take us from the, the theory of dignity to two short practical questions about the actual functioning of the parole system itself. Mm -hmm. um, Professor Kerr, I, I don't, I, if I'm over, oversimplifying your argument, I apologize and you'll correct me, but it seems that part of your position is we, we all know that really these people are never getting out. We all know that really these parole boards are, are not going to let mass murderers out. And I wonder if, if that's the case, then why do we bother doing it? I mean, are these just show trials that we put them on and we, we you know, if they were let out, that would be a problem and we know that's not really gonna happen. Surely we should only give people parole hearings if we think and we're comfortable with the possibility of people being released. Uh, but my second short uh, question is, the parole hearings, the parole board itself is an incredibly opaque system. They don't publish reasons for their judgments um, members of the media are not allowed to have access to exhibits or transcripts of parole board hearings and there's actually a hearing at the Federal Court of Appeal I think just this Monday challenging that provision. So perhaps we might all, whatever we think about BCNET, have more faith in the parole system if it was less opaque and we actually knew more about how it functioned and maybe that's a possibility of some consensus on the, on the panel today. I'm bringing a really practical discussion of how parole works to my first year criminal law class now because I just so agree with that. Now, it's not as opaque anymore. You can actually access the decisions. You just have to go on and request like many journalists instantly did with, with Sanderson, um, the young guy who killed these people in Saskatchewan. They, they went and got his stat release. He almost had his stat release revoked and you can request and obtain those decisions. So they're not inaccessible, but they're not just posted on Canly. Um, you can also read the parole board policy manual. And of course, there are many judicial review decisions of parole decisions that are in federal court and that are reported. Um, it's fair to say there are not many lawyers who do this kind of work. Like even defense counsel, there'll be 80, 90% of them have never done a parole hearing. Um, so it is a niche kind of focused area. Um, and, and I think it's really the job of law professors, especially those who have this expertise, to take care, to communicate to the public as much as possible about how it works. That, and I, I mean, I, I'm not famous enough to have an impact, but I do what I can on this front, right? Um, but I think your first point is a really good one, that there's really some tension my husband was pointing out this tension in my talk last night to me. Very helpful when they, when they identify what's wrong with your talk the night before you're headed into your conference. Um, he goes, Lisa, you're saying this decision is so important, but you're also saying it absolutely won't generate the release of anybody. Um, so, so what's the point of it? And I mean, I think you could bring that same critique to Stephen Harper when he passed this law and say, why are you doing this? It's not gonna change anything. The parole board doesn't tend to miss it when you have six murder victims, right? They, they, and, and so, you know, the critique could be, <laughs> could go there too. But I think it is important to recognize that it does bring a degree of hope to people serving these sentences. Um, I know that personally from working with the John Howard Society in order to get the decision communicated to these guys. Because some of them need to bring 24-1 applications if their appeal is exhausted. Um, some of them need to bring an appeal that asks to be sentenced under the now criminal code regime. And so, you know, it does bring a degree of hope to them.
Um, so it has an impact, I think, on the experience of imprisonment. The final thing, I know this is too long, but Mr. Bissonnette is an interesting example. Like, it's easy to say with the Paul Bernardos, the Robert Pictons, the, um, uh, you know, these type of people, Bruce MacArthur. It's easy to say there. These are people who are offended over years with police not figuring it out. And um, they have many, it, it, it's character logical for them, right? Like, I think with them, you can just say, they probably won't even seek a parole hearing, but if they do, it'll be an open shut. Mr. Bissonnette is very young. He committed his offense after being um, motivated by exposure to this filth on the internet. And it is possible that he could look like a very different human being in 25 years. I don't know, but I think it's a different kind of offender. Sorry, way too long, but I had to. Yeah. Uh, just so very quickly, uh, on this point, um, I mean, sure, Bissonnette had no previous records. He, you know, was a young man uh, of average intelligence, as far as anybody could tell. He had uh, a job and so on. And, 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 but to me, that actually makes it much more worrying. Because just imagine what it would take, what sort of hatred it would take for somebody like that to risk his freedom and his life to go out there and do what he did. Right? Uh, that actually, it seems to me, uh, Represent perhaps a different type of offender, sure, but but I do sort of question whether um, it, uh, it makes him a sort of a more perhaps you know reformable offender. Uh, and of course, uh, and, and the other point, which I think has you know been floating around, really is if he reforms, if he becomes the most saintly person in the universe, does it really matter, right? Does it really matter given the gravity of his crime? What does it say about the human dignity of his victims that? Um, just because he becomes a good person that he should be restored to the ranks of citizenship. Uh, now, I just want to perhaps make another very quick kind of point to, what some, something, what, uh, to, to something Stephen said, in case we, we, we run out of time, which is that, yes, we have a system of criminal sentencing which is actually perhaps by, modern, uh, by, historic, by world historic standards unusual, and that's been very correctly pointed out, that requires a couple of things, right? Uh, most people don't really like it, but they will go along with it if they feel that there is a you know, if, if essentially they feel that you no, know, the system isn't taking the piss, right? Um, and, since, uh, and I mean, it's very hard to know uh, at what point do people reach this uh, people reach this inflection point. But I think the danger is that maybe at some point in the future, given and especially given the way some of the jurisprudence has been going, um, uh, uh, the uh, 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 mandatory sentences being uh, uh, being uh, being struck down left and right, and indeed our Minister of Justice preemptively getting rid of. Um, uh, of, uh, mandatory, uh, of mandatory minimums, uh, I, I do worry at, that uh, we may at some point reach a point where the great name public says, well, actually, this is not a system which we can support. And of course, when, uh, once the criminal justice system loses popular support, we tend to revert to more um, perhaps primitive forms of um, self-help punishment or of vigilantism, which are actually quite ugly. So actually, this, and this is my pitch to people who don't share my, my perhaps views uh, on, on, on punishment, right? If you want to preserve the system, uh, advanced, morally enlightened system of criminal punishment, you do have to make sure that it, it does not expose itself to, uh, to contempt, that, that it does not go too far from what the average Canadian, not the imaginary Canadian of, uh, of the Supreme Court, but the real average Canadian thinks about punishment and deterrence and rehabilitation. Oops. Sorry, just uh, want to echo that very, very briefly, and I think we're coming up against our hard limit, so I apologize. But in addition to that you know, potential theoretical concern about vigilantism, I also am concerned, at least to some degree, even though I oppose mandatory minimum sentences, I think they're much more vulnerable to successful constitutional challenges. If there is a kind of um, knock-on effect from cases like Bissonnette, and I think there's an interesting piece by Sean pa Fine in the Globe and Mail recently about this, where rehabilitation gets overemphasized. I'm not saying this is going to happen, and this is a long-term trend, but if you follow that trend line a little too far, you would get, potentially, uh, a real backlash. And one of the other things that could result from that is a further kind of political polarization, both generally in our democracy, which I don't think is a good thing, and also, more specifically, more attention being paid to the ideological preferences of judges and the politicization of the appointments process, which in the main, I think, would be a negative development. 
Thank you, and thank you so much to our panelists today. I think we had a really good discussion. I mean, I'm sorry to the people who still have questions. People need to eat. I'm sorry. So thank you so much.